Bibles and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. And uh, we'll look here in the Word of God this morning and uh, ask you to pray with us for us that God will take uh, the message and speak to hearts. Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. I'll give you just a moment here to find your place. And then after you find your place, we'll read this passage of Scripture. And then we'll have a word of prayer and then bring the message God has laid upon our heart. Ecclesiastes chapter number 12 and verse number 13. The Bible says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Father, I pray that you take the word of God and speak to our hearts. Lord, give us wisdom. I pray that you'll help us to say only the things that you would have us to say. May the Word of God have free course. I pray that you'll speak to, uh, Lord, every individual, Lord, today and help them to uh, respond accordingly as you would have them to. And may the will of God be done. And, Lord, we'll love you, we'll thank you, and we'll praise you. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen and amen. I want to preach a few moments uh, this morning on this subject, on seeing the big picture. Seeing the big picture. Solomon, of course, being the author of the book of Ecclesiastes, we know that Solomon wrote 3,000 Proverbs and 1,005 songs. And then he wrote three books of the Bible. Uh, Though there's no certainty as to the order of those books, most believe that Solomon wrote Song of Solomon while he was young and in love, and Proverbs while that he was at... Uh, a middle-aged man and he was the sharpest mentally and, and his mind was, was the strongest. And of course the Proverbs uh, uh, within themselves, we know that. And then finally writing Ecclesiastes when Solomon was old, disappointed and somewhat depressed at the carnality of life. He views uh, everything in the book of Ecclesiastes as life under the sun. And we know as Christians that's not the way that we are to view life. We're to look at life above the sun. We're not to look at things in uh, uh, through the lenses of this world, but through the lenses of another world. And Solomon is coming to the end of not just his life, but the end of his writings here. And uh, he wants to give... Uh, he wants to give some encouragement. He wants to give some wisdom uh, that he has gathered along the way. He is looking at life uh, uh, from this end, uh, looking backwards. And he's looking at eternity as he's standing, looking forward. Uh, I read a statement by a man by the name of Lord Beaconsfield, a former prime minister of Britain, and he made this statement about life. He said, youth is a mistake, manhood a struggle, and old age a regret. And I would say that that is viewed as Solomon would view it. It's not necessarily true if we live for God, if we serve God. We don't have to view our youth as a mistake, our manhood as a struggle, and our old age as regret. Life does not have to be that way. And Solomon realized that, but... Solomon realized that in his old age. And as he comes to chapter 12 and verse number 13 here, after all of his wealth and all of his wisdom, all of the women and the worship and the woes of life, that uh, he finally sees the big picture. And that's what I want to preach on this morning is seeing the big picture. And when I say that, I'm talking about the big picture of life. How do you and I view life? Because Solomon in this text here, he views man in two different settings. In verse number 13... He sees man on earth. As he said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. He's talking about man and life on earth. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And then Solomon views man in eternity. In verse number 14, as he says, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. I want to say this uh, uh, this morning that whenever a man is standing at the uh, end of life and he's standing on the edge, of eternity, he looks at life totally different. His perspective is different in life. He he sees the big picture, and that's where Solomon is at. And how a man lives on earth will definitely determine how he's going to uh, be judged in eternity. And so that is what Solomon sees here. Now I want you to notice that uh, Solomon views man. He views man in verse 13, his life here on earth, and he, he sees man's life uh, uh, that it has a conclusion. Notice verse 13. He He said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Solomon realizes that as he looks at man's life on earth, man's life has a conclusion. It has an end. You know, this morning we all need to consider that. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 says, For uh, it is appointed a man once to die, 
And after this, the judgment. We're all going to face eternity. We're all going to face death. We're all going to face God. We're all going to face judgment. Man's life has a conclusion. That's man's life here on earth. Man's life, he says, uh, has a creator. Notice what he said. He said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. That, that is what uh, Solomon sees at the end of life. He sees the conclusion of his life, but he also sees his creator. In fact, Verse number 1 says, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. We ought to think about our Creator every day. We ought to think about our Creator as we go throughout life. Solomon said, man's life here on earth, he should remember he has a conclusion. He should remember he has a Creator. He should remember he has commandments. Notice what he said, keep his commandments. You know, we've been commanded by God. And God has given us His Word, and His Word is filled with commandments. People today don't want to live by the commandments of God. They want to live by their own way, their own will. But Solomon said, looking back at life, as I stand at the end of it, I see the big picture of life. And he said, man's life here on earth, he should be reminded that he has a conclusion. He has a creator, but he has commandments. God has given man responsibilities. He's given him obligations. And God is intending to, uh, to hold man to that obligation. And so uh, those responsibilities of life. And so man has commandments. And then he tells us in verse number 13 that as he views man's life here on earth, that man's life has a cause. Look what he said. He said, for, for this is the whole duty of man. Man has a duty in life. He has a cause. He has a purpose. We're not just, uh, we're not just uh, cr created beings that are just living here on earth without a purpose. No, God has a plan. God has a will for every man's life. Your, your life has a purpose in being here. You're not here by chance or circumstance and, or, or accident, but divine providence. God allowed you to be born. He allowed you to have life. He allowed you to live here on earth. He has allowed you to be born in America. All of this, uh, uh, God has a sovereign purpose, a sovereign plan, and you and I have to remember that in life, that man's life here on earth, it has a cause. And the question is, 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 is whether or not you and I are living up to that cause, whether or not we're doing what God has, has called us to do. Are we living for the right causes in life? So man's life here on earth. And then uh, Solomon quickly shifts in verse number 14 to not man's life here on earth, but now he deals with man's Lord there in eternity. In verse number 14, Solomon is not emphasizing man's life, but he's emphasizing Man's Lord in eternity. Man's Lord will judge him in eternity. That's what the Bible teaches, Hebrews 9, 27. We quoted just a few moments ago. And Solomon has some things to say about man's Lord in eternity. He tells us about this judgment in verse 14 that first of all that it will be a sovereign judgment. He said, for God shall bring every work into judgment. I think we ought to be remembered that and be reminded that we're going to be judged by God. We're not going to be judged by man. We're not going to be judged by ourselves. But we're going to be judged by God. You know, a lot of times in life, people will do that. They, they, will, well, they will compare themselves to other people as if that's the standard of life when it's not. Sometimes people will compare themselves to life itself and, and they'll look at their life compared to life itself and they'll start feeling good about their life and what they've done, what they've accomplished. But I'm going to tell you something. Life is not going to judge us. Man is not going to judge us for God. Well, it's a sovereign judgment. We're going to face our Creator one day. We're going to see Him face to face and we're going to stand in His presence. And, and that's something, that's the big picture of life and that's the big picture of eternity is that we're headed to a judgment seat we're headed to a judgment throne, and, and on that throne will be the creator of life. It's a sovereign judgment. And then he tells us it will be a sure judgment. He said, for God, notice these next two words, shall bring. I want to tell you something about judgment. It's sure. You can't escape it. You know, if you're lost today and you don't know God, you need to think about that. There's no escaping the judgment of God. There's no getting away from it. If you're here and you don't know Christ as your Savior, then you need to come and accept Jesus Christ. You, you cannot escape that judgment uh, today. It's a sure judgment. I'm going to face God. You're going to face God. And the question is not if we're going to face Him, but how are we going to face Him? It's a sovereign judgment. It, the Bible says here it is a sure judgment. And then I want you to see that it is a separated judgment. The Word of God said, For God shall bring every work into judgment. 
You know what God's going to do on Judgment Day? He's going to separate every individual and He's going to separate every work. Now, we don't believe in a general judgment. The Bible teaches in 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 10, that talking to the saved, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every man shall give an account of the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Every man, every individual, every saved person, every saved individual will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. We'll give an account of our works, and and our works are going to be tried in the fire. The Bible said the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So the deeds that I have done here on earth as as a saved person, the deeds I've done as a child of God, one day I'll stand at the judgment seat and I'll give an account of of every deed. And not just that, but Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 36, that every idle word that man shall speak, he shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. So it's all the way down to not just my my works, but, but my words is going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. My wealth is going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. What I did with the money that God gave me, how that I used it as a Christian, how that I invested it. Was I a good steward or not a good steward? I, listen, the, everything as, as a child of God one day will be judged. Then also the wicked, the lost. You may be here and say, well, I'm not even saved, preacher. Every work, every individual. Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 11. John said, And I saw a great white throne, and he that sat upon the throne, the Bible said, From whose face the heaven and the earth fled away, and there was found no place for them. And John said, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. And the Bible said, Every man according to his works. You see, if you're lost today, you die without Jesus Christ, just like the rich man in Luke 16, you would go to hell. But one day, the Bible says in that same passage, And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. The Bible said every man was judged according to his works. You're going to be judged one day, every deed. You say, well, I'm lost. If I die without God and go to hell, you'll be cast in the lake of fire. But because of your works, they're going to be judged at the great white throne judgment. And those works will determine where you find your place in the lake of fire. Every man's work. The Bible said that Solomon written, wrote it here in chapter 12 and verse 14 that every work is going to be brought into judgment. This is a sovereign judgment. This is a sure judgment. This is a separated judgment. Then I want you to notice it is a serious judgment. Solomon said, with every secret thing. It's a serious judgment. You know, people do things down here and they think that by manipulation, by deception, that they're fooling people. I want to say you may fool a lot of people, but you'll never fool God. Proverbs 15 and verse 3, the Bible said, The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Beholding the evil and the good. God sees all, God hears all, and God knows all. And one day when we stand before God, He will reveal all. Every secret thing is going to be brought into judgment. Friend, if you're, if you're lost, you need to get right with God. For every deed you've ever done, every word you've ever said is going to be brought to light one day. And if you're saved, you're not exempt just because we're saved. We, we, can't, we can't bypass that judgment. It's a serious judgment. I think Solomon is teaching this along with the Apostle Paul that how we live our life every day, we ought to live it in light of the judgment seat. Uh, just because we're saved and going to heaven, that's wonderful. But we ought to fear that judgment seat. We ought to fear standing before God. We ought to fear the fact that we're going to give an account to God one of these days. It's something that we ought to take seriously. And the deeds that we uh, do and the things that we say, one day we'll face Him in judgment. It's a serious judgment. And then I want to say this, it's a sound judgment. Because Solomon said here, whether it be good or whether it be evil. You know, God will be fair on Judgment Day. And what I mean by that, I know that I'm not talking about salvation. Mercy and grace is not fair. If you and I got what we deserve, we would be in hell. We know that. But when God begins to separate, that, uh, separate man's deeds, and when God begins to look at man as individuals, if they're lost or if they're saved, when God holds them accountable for the life that they have lived, it's going to be a sound judgment. It's going to be fair. And what I mean by that, God is not going to bring out all the good things that we have done and make us smell like roses and, and just tell all the good about everything in our life and, and, and leave out all the bad. No, He's not going to do that. And God's not just going to bring out all the bad and leave out the good, the things that... <clears throat> 
the times that we have served him and then the times that we have surrendered to him. He's not gonna, he's not gonna just do that. God's gonna bring every work in a job, whether it be good or whether it be evil. It doesn't matter to if, if what you and I say or do, it doesn't matter who we are, it doesn't matter our position, it doesn't matter our status in society, it doesn't matter what other people, you know, we, we hold people in high esteem, what other people we don't hold in high esteem. But I'm gonna tell you about the judgment seat. The judgment seat is gonna pan everything out. We're going to see everything just as it is, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Solomon standing at the end of life, and Solomon looking into eternity. Solomon said there's two things man needs to remember. He needs to see the big picture, and the big picture is this, man's life here on earth, man's Lord in eternity. Now here's the question, what do we do with that? I want you to notice in verse number 13 that Solomon he takes and use this, uses that, this phrase that the Apostle Paul used. Notice the first two words. He said, let us. Solomon said, in light of man's life here on earth and man's Lord in eternity, there's three things in this verse that you and I need to do. Let us. Number one, he said, let us hear. You and I need to be ready to listen. We need to be ready to learn. We need to be ready to live the life that God has given us. We need to hear. I, I see people so many times in church when I'm preaching, they're not listening. They're not, they're not learning anything. I see people sometimes they get on their cell phone in church and, and, and I can tell they're, uh, you know, maybe their, their glasses are lit up or maybe their face is lit up or, or maybe I can tell they're just not, they don't look at their Bible that intensely that they're doing something. They're roaming. They're looking at something else other than listening. A lot of times people's minds wander. They, they think about it. I think distractions is one of the biggest tools that the devil uses today to try to get our minds off the, the Word of God. But if you and I are going to, to face God in eternity, if you and I are going to live the life that we're supposed to live down here and face Him on the other side in a right manner, we've got to hear what the Spirit would say to the church. That still small voice on the inside of you. You need to listen to it. You need to hear the voice of God. I, I spend my days, and I don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that I'm always an obedient child, but I try to spend my days listening to that voice. I've not always obeyed that voice. I've not always done everything that voice has said. I wish I could say that. But I want to hear what that voice says to me. If he wants to speak to me, let us hear. You say, preacher, what am I supposed to do with, with, with life, the, the big picture of life? How am I supposed to live it and not mess it up? How am, I, how am I supposed to be ready for eternity? Let us hear. Hear the Word of God. Hear this message this morning. The sum of life is, what are you doing for Christ? Are you saved? Do you know Him this morning? Let us hear the message. Look beyond the man and hear the message. Secondly, not only let us hear, but Solomon says in verse number 13, let us fear. Let us hear the conclusion the whole matter. Fear God. I want to say this is not, uh, this is not a, a fear of walking in light of the fact that, that God is out to get me. But this is a reverential fear. It's a respect. It's reality. It's righteousness. It, it is fearing God in a manner that changes my whole perspective of life and how that I live, the decisions that I make. And I want to say the Bible is clear. We're not to fear man. We're not to fear fate. We're not to fear calamities. We're not to fear uh, circumstances or uncertainties. There's a lot of fear in our nation right now. But I'll tell you, what our nation needs to do is not fear uh, a sickness, not fear a virus, not fear the, 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 the uncertainties of life, but what our nation needs to fear is they need to fear our Creator, fear God. We need to walk in, in light of His Word and reverence Him. The Solomon, a wise man, the wisest man that ever lived, as he looks at the end of life and he sees the big picture, he said, I'll tell you what you need to do. Number one, you need to hear. And number two, you need to fear. I think as men grow closer to the end if they're saved as we grow closer to the end of life the reality of the end becomes more vivid you know some people's life are just cut down short they and they never they never really took in the the brevity of life because they were so young they were fooled by their age of thinking that well I've got plenty of time but as we get older as we grow nearer we grow more ready to leave this world. And I think the fear of what we're going to face, not in the fact that we're afraid of, you know, I'm not afraid of death. I'm not afraid of eternity. I'm not afraid of, of where I'm going to go when I leave this life. But I'll be honest with you, there is a fear, a reverence that I'm going to face God in that judgment. That's a serious matter. 
And I think it's something that we ought to think about every day because it has an effect on our life. He said, let us hear. Preacher, what am I supposed to do with man's life and man's Lord on earth and in eternity? Let us hear, let us fear. And then let me say this in closing, let us be near. Solomon said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Here's what he said. Keep His commandments. Keep His commandments. Let us be near. That means to keep God's commandments, to keep His commandments, means that we must know His commandments. I think there's a lot of people today that the reason they don't live right is because they don't read the Word of God. They don't, they don't hear preaching like they're... You know, the fact of the matter is this. If you go back, go back 30 years ago, and you don't have to go that far back, but when people... Society lived more moral the more of the preaching of the Word of God than the more of the Bible that we had in society. When people start taking the Word of God out and we start watering down sermons and we start uh, everything becomes a feel good, you know what happens? People, their morality goes down. They don't fear God. And I want to say if we're going to keep God's commandments, we have to know His commandments. You know, it's easier to live for God when you know what's expected. I think about my children when they were growing up. If they knew my will and they knew my word, then they knew how to conduct themselves. I couldn't expect them at three years of age to live like I expected them at 13 years of age because, one, they couldn't comprehend my will. Uh, they couldn't comprehend all of my words. And, and they didn't know all of my words and all of my will. But I spoke to them as a three-year-old, then as a five-year-old, then as a seven-year-old. But as they grew, as they come along in life, they knew more and more about what my will was for them, what was expected, what my words was to them. In fact, every, every teenager will finally get to the point that if they have parents that raised them and trained them, them, they already know what their parents are going to say about some things. Why is that? Because they know their parents' words. They know their parents' will. They already know what their parents would do in that situation. Well, God, as our Heavenly Father, the more that we know His commandments, the more we can keep His commandments. I, I, there's times when my children was growing up, they would do things that I would have to correct them, sometimes out of disobedience, and sometimes it was out of ignorance because they did not know what the commandment was. They had not reached that point in life. And I want to tell you, God gave us a book. He gave us His Word. He gave us plenty of commandments. And if you and I are going to uh, see the the big picture, then here's what we're going to have to do. We're not just going to have to hear and fear, but we're going to have to draw near. We're going to have to keep the commandments of the Word of God. You say, preacher, how do I do that? We must seek them. Get in the Word of God and we must study them. We ought to spend time. Not just preachers. Preachers shouldn't just study. In fact, even as a preacher, I don't think you should just study because you're a preacher. You ought to study the Bible as a Christian. You ought to read the Word of God. Memorize it. Study it. Let it run through your life. Let it run through your mind. Know that. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Be a workman. That's not just preachers and teachers. That's every individual. We must seek them. We must study them. We must share them. You know, it's good to take your children to church. But you ought to train them. You ought to teach them. You ought to give them the Word of God. If they're going to keep those commandments, they have to know them. They have to be tucked away in their heart and their mind. That's the sum. That's the big picture. That's the conclusion of the whole matter is that we're to be near. Let us. We must seek them. We must study. We must share. And then finally, we must show them. So what do you mean? I mean that we ought to live out those commandments. People ought to be able to look at your life as a Christian and know that you're living by the commandment of God. A lost world ought to look at us and say, you know what? I know that's a Christian by the way they live. Not by what they say, but how they live. We must show the commandments of God. Obedience is an expression. It's, a, it's an action that, that can be seen by all, that can be seen by others around. And we must be near. I want to say that as Solomon comes to the end of life, Solomon sees the big picture. How about you today, friend? Do you see the big picture? If you're saved, do you see the big picture as a Christian? That life is not about the abundance of things. Life is not about the American dream. As a child of God, life is about doing the Lord's will. And then if you're lost, do you see the big picture? Do you realize that the things of life can never bring you satisfaction, that there will never be no peace, there will never be no joy outside of knowing Jesus? Do you realize that one day your life is going to end and one day you're going to face God in eternity and judgment? That you need to be born again if you're lost without God, I want to encourage you. Let today be your day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. You need to accept Christ today. You don't need to put it off. You don't need to wait. You need to come to Him right now while you still have time. You need to bow your head and bend your knee and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Come into my heart.
and accept, and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and your personal Savior. Father, I pray that you'll take the Word of God. And I pray, dear God, that you'll do what needs to be done. Lord, for anyone that may be lost, God, I pray for their salvation. I pray for their soul. God, I pray that as they look at the big picture, they'll look beyond this world and they'll realize eternity. They'll realize that they're going to face God in judgment and they need to be ready to face you in salvation. May they be born again. And I pray, God, for those of us that are saved, Lord, that we will not get so caught up in this life that we forget that man's life here on earth, it has a conclusion, has a creator, it has a cause. And Lord, help us to remember that we're facing a serious judgment, a sovereign judgment. And may we realize the need for Christ. I pray that you'd be glorified and magnified. Have your will, have your way, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.